previously on Anglican Identity. It's a useful list that highlights some of the things that are distinctive about Anglicanism. Anglican worship is much more than a performance to be observed or listened to. In any Eucharist, Christ is present in multiple ways. But the Anglican Church is broad and makes space for many voices, and each voice takes care to make space for others. We've spent some time previously here on Anglican identity, working out what Anglican Christians believe, but there's more that makes the Anglican Church distinctive. There's another way to understand the Anglican Church, how it's organised. One of the benefits of the way we organise ourselves is that we have uh, accountability to uh, a higher authority, if you want to call bishops and archbishops that, or synod. But there's that sense of there is someone uh, above you for support and someone above you for accountability. For me, it's that everyone can contribute and have a voice from our youngest people in our parishes and our schools to the older generation that have been in our churches and our place of worship for such a long time. They have a voice and they can be heard and we have ways to work with each other. We have bishops and um, and, and, and parishes and there's, it's clear and people feel held, I think, that if there's a, uh, a, if there's a question of conflict or a question that needs clarifying, there's, it, you feel held and safe because there is a way of dealing with that that has everyone's best interests at heart. Um, what do I value about it? So I value that there is accountability. I value that, um, that it is scriptural. So it has a, has a long history um, and it has remained, which means that there's wisdom in that structure. First, there is actually no central governing authority. Anglican.org puts it well. The worldwide Anglican Church does not exist, at least not in the form that one might think. There are millions of Anglicans, many thousands of parishes, and hundreds of dioceses. There are nearly 40 independent Anglican national churches, none of which has authority over any other. The Anglican Church was originally spread to other countries through English colonisation. As the colonies became independent from England, so did their churches. After the end of the colonial era, the Anglican Church continued to spread via missionary work. There was never a post-colonial attempt to regenerate a central administration with actual authority over the churches outside England. Doctrine is followed by consensus and not by mandate. Doctrinal consensus stems from shared history and roots in England and is sustained by relationships among the international family of churches. Together, these churches form what's called the Anglican Communion. The communion is bound together by common beliefs and practices. A church that shares those beliefs and practices is welcome to be part of the Anglican Communion. The Anglican Communion Office in London maintains what we call the Instruments of Unity or the Instruments of Communion. The glue that holds relationships together, the Lambeth Conference, the Primates Meeting, uh, more on what a primate is soon, the Anglican Consultative Council and the Archbishop of Canterbury, who is more a figurehead for the Communion, but has no legal authority outside the Church of England. The Archbishop of Canterbury is called Primus Inter Pares, first among equals, of the various national leaders of the Anglican Communion. The Archbishop of Canterbury is selected by the Government of Great Britain in conjunction with the Church of England, but is ultimately appointed by the Crown, the head of the church, rather than by any international church process. The Archbishop of Canterbury has no direct authority over the National Australian Church. The current Archbishop of Canterbury? That's Justin Welby. Let's hear from him. Why am I a Christian? After I left school, I was working in Kenya, out in the bush, a long way from any towns. And in the small mud church in the village where I was living, and in the staff of the very, very basic school where I was working, 
I saw the reality of the difference that Jesus Christ makes to people's lives. And when I then prayed a prayer of opening my heart and my life to Christ, something changed, and that change has been there ever since. I meet constantly the most amazing people and have the most wonderful conversations, which leave me gasping for air because it's such a privilege to be involved in that way. And what if hundreds of people are praying at once? Does God think carefully about every single prayer? In England, I go around in the southern part of the country, which is my responsibility. It's such a wonderful, diverse, exciting country to live in. My children would say that it improves me considerably. <laughs> You're constantly working cross-culturally. I mean, you need to remember the Anglican Communion has well over 2,000 languages and well over 2,000 cultures. I mean, there's over 300 languages in Papua New Guinea by itself. And as I travel around, the most notable feature of Anglicans is they are bridge builders. I think other churches, well, I'm not saying others aren't. It just seems we do it, I don't know, it seems to be in the DNA of Anglicanism. The joys are, first of all, the people I work with, both here at Lambeth, but also the bishops and many, many other Christians, other Christian leaders, other religious leaders. Another one is the prayer and the worship that is simply embedded in my life in a way that I can never remember before. We have a religious community here that prays constantly and I join them for morning prayer, for communion at midday, for evening prayer. And, and it's just wonderful. We pray for those going through the darkness Christian disciples constantly need to be renewing their life of prayer. Throughout history, the church has flourished when there have been communities of people, whether they live together or not, who have a rule of life which involves them meeting together, praying together, studying scripture together, and encouraging each other in discipleship, in what it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, back to organisation. What is the fundamental unit of church administration and governance for Anglicans? You might think it's the parish church, but that's actually not quite right for Anglicans. The diocese is actually the fundamental unit. A diocese is an area looked after by a bishop. Dioceses are made up of smaller areas called parishes and may also include other organisations like schools, community services and many others. Parish is a word to describe a small geographical area, urban, suburban or rural. Many parishes have only one church some have more than one. A number of dioceses together may form a province. The Australian provinces are the province of Queensland, which includes the Northern Territory, the province of New South Wales, which includes the ACT, the province of Victoria, the province of South Australia, the province of Western Australia, and the extra provincial diocese, which is Tasmania. Here in Australia, our provinces combine to form the National Church, which is autonomous. What does it mean for a National Church to be autonomous? Autonomous literally means self-ruling and self-governing. As we've noted before, there is no larger administrative unit that supervises it. No Pope, no Cardinals, and no Patriarch. So how are decisions made? We've noted there is no central governance of the International Anglican Communion. 
Each of the member churches or provinces of the Anglican Communion is self-governed. The rules under which a church is governed are called canon law. The structure of canon law is like that of modern civil law. A parish has rules or bylaws which must conform to the rules or canons of the diocese of which it is a member. That diocese, in turn, must stay within the canons of the province and national church. The provinces and national churches by choice have inherited and adapted the canons of the Christian church dating back to its earliest days. In practice, this means that dioceses can often make their own rules. The national church might pass laws through its parliamentary process, called General Synod, but often it is up to the individual diocese to adopt these at their own synod meetings. Ordaining women to be deacons and priests is a case in point. The National Church in Australia decided that this could happen back in the early 90s. The Brisbane Diocese adopted that practice immediately, as did 20 of the 23 dioceses in Australia. But some chose to reject the possibility, and still do. Despite this, all 23 dioceses within Australia remain within the Anglican Church of Australia and meet together in a general synod every three years or so. The bishops in all countries get together too. About every 10 years, there is a Lambeth Conference, which invites all the bishops of the Anglican Communion to gather and discuss issues facing the church and the world. Resolutions passed at the Lambeth Conference are not binding on any member churches unless they choose to modify their own canons, their own laws in other words, in light of the Lambeth Resolutions. Since we're talking about bishops, Let's make sense of them too. Anglican.org makes three points. A central feature of Anglican churches are bishops. The Greek word for bishop is episcopus, which is the origin of the word episcopal, and for that matter of the word bishop. In Latin, it became episcopus, while in the Old English, it was biscop, which came to be pronounced bishop and later spelled that way too. Worldwide, there are some 900 active Anglican bishops. Every Anglican bishop has been consecrated by other bishops, who are in turn consecrated by other bishops. This process forms a chain that some believe extends all the way back to the 12 apostles seen as the first bishops. There are historical doubts about this, but our faith doesn't depend on it. Historians have traced the succession of bishops back to the early 2nd century CE. So the bishops are the spiritual successors of the apostles, and the chain of consecration is part of what's called apostolic succession. Apostolic succession also means continuing in the faith of the apostles. But what do bishops actually do? There are some things that only bishops can do, like confirmations and ordinations. But I think one of the most important things that a bishop can do is to serve as a focus for unity. Yeah, that's the old language. And that means that wherever a bishop goes, um, they remind the people in that place that they're part of something much bigger, part of a diocese and part of a, a church that's bigger than just the parish. Uh, and one of the times when this is most evident is at a commissioning of a new priest and the bishop hands the license to the priest and says, uh, take this license which is mine and yours. And, and it's that terrific moment of saying to them, you're not in this alone, you're part of something much bigger. And that's a really important role for the bishop to play. We've already mentioned that the primary unit of organisation and governance of the Anglican Church is the diocese. Presiding over each diocese is a bishop who is called the diocesan bishop. Some large dioceses, such as Brisbane, have others called assistant bishops. Here, each is assigned a region to care for and guide or shepherd, if you like. When dioceses are combined into provinces or national churches, there is another layer. This next level is overseen by an archbishop. 
In the province of Queensland, our Archbishop is called Metropolitan of the Province of Queensland and has some limited responsibilities in relation to other dioceses in the province. The Metropolitan, though, cannot direct the other diocesan bishops in their own dioceses. So, what do archbishops do? Archbishops do basically what all bishops do. Uh, bishops keep an eye on things. They, uh, the word bishop comes from a Greek word which really means to watch over. It's, uh, a bishop is an overseer, someone who watches over the people of God and the church. So bishops spend a lot of time being with the people of the church. They spend a lot of time visiting parishes and schools and community service agencies to be alongside people, to support and encourage them in the work they're doing, and to make sure they keep their finger on the pulse of what's going on. Because part of a bishop's job too is to teach the faith and to help people connect with the really fundamental stories and values, the kind of reference points that can help guide them in their work. Where something might be heading in the wrong direction, it's a bishop's job to kind of steer it back on track. Um, so visiting people and pastoring people, that, that language about being a pastor really comes from the image of a shepherd. You know, a shepherd is someone who watches over the flock and guides and steers it uh, safely to pasture, so where it can live a uh, fulfilling life. So that, that's basically what a bishop does, and that's really what an archbishop does too. The difference, I think, is that an archbishop also has some responsibility towards the other dioceses that help make up the province. So the Archbishop of Brisbane, the office I hold, has some responsibility for the other dioceses in what make up what we call the province of Queensland. So the other dioceses in Queensland and the Diocese of the Northern Territory. It's not that the Archbishop has primary responsibilities for those dioceses, their, their own bishops watch over them, uh, but the Archbishop has some relationship with those other bishops to help uh, support them and encourage them and to be a sounding board for them about issues that they might be wrestling with. So an Archbishop is a bishop but with a bit broader responsibility than the normal run of the mill bishop. An Archbishop also, like all bishops, has a role in the governance of the church. So the, the various councils of the church that make decisions about where money is spent and about budgets and about appointments of key people. So the Archbishop chairs what's called the Diocesan Council in the Diocese of Brisbane um, and sits on various committees and commissions to take a part in the decision making of the church. We have to be accountable to governments in various areas. So for example, with the services that Anglicare provides, the buck really stops with the diocesan council, but it is advised and guided by the Community Services Commission. In the same way with schools, for all the schools that the church owns and runs, the buck stops with the diocesan council, but it is guided by the experts on the Anglican Schools Commission. So the Archbishop uh, has a role in diocesan council, usually chairs it. The Archbishop chairs the diocesan synod, which is where the whole diocesan family comes together to discuss issues of importance and to make big decisions. Um, the Archbishop also has a role in provincial governance. From time to time, the provincial synod is called, only very rarely, I think the last time the Provincial Synod met was over 10 years ago when it became possible for the first time to uh, ordain women as bishops. We had to change one of the church laws to make that possible. Uh, so governance is, a, is another key area where bishops exercise responsibility. Archbishops are also looked to to be people who can be the public face of the church, so to represent the church in the public arena. And sometimes that becomes really critical where the church is being challenged and critiqued for a failing, and failures happen in every generation of the life of the church, 
when the wider community is looking for someone to answer on behalf of the church, then it's often bishops and archbishops who are called upon to do that. A recent example, you know, in the last decade or so has been the Royal Commission into institutional responses to child sexual abuse. There were very serious questions the church had to answer and be held accountable for. And so I had a role in appearing before the commission and, and explaining what had gone on in the life of the church and reflecting with the commission on why things happened that had happened. Um, so another aspect of that is making submissions to parliamentary inquiries. When important legislation is before the parliament and the church has a view that the church believes should be heard among the other views in the community, uh, then it's often bishops who will make presentations at those inquiries on behalf of the church. A recent example of that was the inquiry into voluntary assisted dying legislation where the churches had views they thought should be on the table as the government, the parliament, made decisions on behalf of the community. So we've mentioned bishops and now archbishops. But there are other ways we organise people in the church. You can call them orders. There are three orders in the Anglican Church. There are deacons, priests and bishops. Archbishops fit in to the category of bishops here. There's the laity too, of course, though laity is not technically an order. We've talked about bishops. To build the model at the other end, we have the laity or lay people, which is most of us. Laity come from the Greek, laikos, of the people. Technically, the laity aren't any of us who are baptised, though not ordained. Well, that is most of us. We'll hear more from this fine group soon. In the Anglican Church, everyone who gets ordained becomes a deacon first. Deacons have a particular representative role, like an ambassador. They are sent by bishops with the authority of the church as a church representative to undertake some task. Being sent with authority is the foundation of all ordained ministry. In a way, deacons are go-betweens, getting important things done for the church. Some deacons are later ordained as priests, often a year later. And what do priests do? What do priests do? Hopefully we pray and we are there for the church and to share the gospel and do church with people in different ways to meet the needs of the community. They care for people and they lead people in their worship. What do priests do? Well, we endeavour to bring before God the needs of the people. Deeply important to me anyway is prayer and, and then also gathering people with me uh, in worship and, and helping them to grow, grow in their capacity to love God, their capacity to love one another, their capacity to catch a hold of the vision, the dream that God has for humanity and the earth. Well, technically what sets priests aside is that we can do what we call the ABC, that makes it easy, absolution, blessing and consecration. So those things, I suppose you could say, in which we become more conduit for the holy. So it's, um, it's why we take choosing our priests so seriously. So one of the real privileges as a priest is absolution. That means that we um, are empowered to um, not only offer God's forgiveness, but, but in um, the rite of confession, we can actually um, assure people their sins are forgiven. B is blessing, so everyone says God bless you. So that's that. That's something that's changed a lot, but historically that, that idea of God's blessing would be something that comes from the priest. And certainly liturgically, the blessing at the end is always the priest. And then consecration, that's the act by which the 
the bread and wine become the real presence of Christ. So those words um, on the night he was betrayed and so on. So those are the three things that only a priest can do. One of the most rewarding things is that the role means that people trust you. So you can go into a hospital to the side of um, someone who's just had a stillborn child and they tell you things that they probably don't tell other people. So for me, um, the liturgical side is amazing because that's, a, that is, I mean, I keep wanting to use the word privilege because that's really how I see it. But the interaction with people, the fact that they trust you at times of fantastic joy and times of deep despair, uh, those, those are the moments when you really feel that maybe God through you is making a contribution. So one of, one of the distinctive roles of a priest in terms of the orders of ministry is that our task is to gather the congregation. So deacons go out and priests gather. So, so that's the kind of role. But of course, part of that, um, there's the liturgical role. Hopefully you're praying for your parishioners. You're visiting those, um, or mostly those in need, telephone calls in some parishes and certainly in ours we offer things like meditation, Bible studies. Our own private prayer is very important, saying the daily office, um, self-education, so the way the world comes, the administrative side has um, increased. There are weddings and funerals and baptisms those are things that completely reorient your week. That's a very, very privileged part of being a priest. So, laity, deacons, priests, bishops. It sounds like a hierarchy, but we don't think of it like that. In essence, the hierarchy is upended because bishops are the servants of everyone and so on. Next time on Anglican Identity. But what makes a flourishing faith community? The point of the church is to organise us to participate in God's mission. Thread Together is a charity that is um, involved in getting clothing out to people um, who are doing it tough. Baruna Farm is an urban farm project located in the grounds of St Francis College here in Milton. Welcome to All Saints Chermside, where on Monday and Wednesday evenings we run a soup kitchen.